وكذلك أوحينا إليك روحا من أمرنا ما كنت تدري ما الكتاب ولا الإيمان ولكن جعلناه نورا ولكن جعلناه نورا نهدي به من نشاء من عبادنا وإنك لتهدي إلى صراط مستقيم صراط الله الذي له ما في السماوات وما في الأرض ألا إلى الله تصير الأمور السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Welcome to a new episode of your show Inspirations We are still trying to learn as much as possible from the life of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam from his wisdom and from his a beautiful character, the way he dealt with different things, with different circumstances, different people. We're trying to benefit from that and we're trying to utilize that so that we can improve our faith as Muslims, our Iman, and we can improve our understanding of Islam and also our practice of it. And we're trying to rejuvenate our souls with more faith and with more Iman so we can uh, actually move on to a higher level in our, in our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now before we uh, start again uh, with the events of the seerah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa I would like to remind you uh, that you can uh, write to us, uh, you can write to our email address, the email address will appear on the screen inshaAllah, inspirations at huda.tv inspirations at huda.tv. We will be very happy to receive your emails and benefit from them as we usually do. And as your emails, mashallah, are beneficial. And I really thank you. I'm, I'm very grateful for that. And uh, I'll remind you that in two weeks' time, inshallah, we will have a live episode, which is the first Saturday uh, of every calendar month. So please join us, uh, call in, and have something to say about the seerah of the Prophet ﷺ. Now last week we were talking about uh, the time when the disbelievers, when the people of Quraysh came to the uncle of the Prophet ﷺ, to Abu Talib and complained to him about Muhammad ﷺ, that he keeps insulting their gods and saying that they are false and speaking, criticizing their way of life, criticizing uh, you know, their the lifestyle. So they, they became, they got fed up with that and they decided to move to talk to Abu Talib, trying to convince him to let Muhammad, if he wants to practice his religion, he can practice it alone, but he shouldn't talk about our gods. He shouldn't criticize our way of life. But the Prophet ﷺ made it clear to them that he is only a messenger. He's conveying a message and he doesn't have any choice when it comes to this. And actually some of the narrations of this event which is weak, but it is the most famous, unfortunately. The narration we mentioned last week was the authentic one, uh, is that the Prophet ﷺ said to them, you see this son, I can't leave what I am upon, just as you can't you know, light a torch by extending it with your own hands to the sun. So this is the authentic narration. There are other weak narrations or other weak versions of this event. One of them says that the Prophet ﷺ said to them, if you place the sun on my right hand and the moon on my left, I will not leave this affair. I will not leave this religion. I will not abandon calling the people to Islam. This narration, when it comes to the rules of the mustalah of hadith, the science of hadith, they don't, this, this narration does not stand the criticism. So we have to point this out. It may be, this narration might be the thing that really happened. We don't know. But as far as we are concerned, when it comes to the science of hadith, this narration does not stand criticism. Now the disbelievers became very disappointed, very frustrated, and they decided to use a different approach. This approach was to intensify the, the torture they would inflict on the Muslims and the followers of Muhammad So they, they started to, uh, you know, uh, tr uh, really inflict as much as possible of their torture and of their abuse towards the Muslims, trying to conv at least to dissuade them from publicizing, publicizing their faith and publicly practicing Islam. Definitely, they couldn't do that with the stronger ones like Umar ibn Khattab and Hamza, 
uh, Ibn Abdul Muttalib, Hamza, the uncle of the Prophet ﷺ, because they were strong men. But the people of Quraysh actually could abuse the weaker Muslims. People like Bilal, people like Khabbab ibn al-Arat, and the rest of the Muslims, and even sometimes the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, sometimes they physically attacked him, they physically abused, abused him, and he was very patient. Because he, for him, you know, uh, this kind of suffering was inevitable. This stage, you know, was very important to move to the next one. So he was patient. He knew that this was the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We have to be patient with it. And, you know, the thing that his sight and his heart were attached to was to seeing his people embracing Islam. So Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa was working on that objective. He was, he was heading towards that goal. And he could see beyond the present reality. He was th- th- thinking of something more, uh, you know, something that has a lot of or oh, his vision was full with hope that his people one day will embrace Islam. And we will see this because this will be manifest, inshallah, in some events to come. So after the companions of the Prophet ﷺ could not put up, could not bear the, uh, the suffering and the torture that they, they had to go through, they complained to the Prophet ﷺ. And when he looked at them and he saw how much you know, suffering they had to go through, how much they, have, they, have, they had to put up with, he said to them, you know, in Abyssinia, There is a king, a just ruler. No one will be dealt with unjustly or unjustly in his land. So go to to his land and live there. Practice your religion freely until Allah gives us a way out from this situation in which we are living in, in Mecca. So the Muslims started to travel to Abyssinia. Some of them traveled alone by themselves. They started to travel and move to Abyssinia in small groups, one or two or maximum three. Why? Because they didn't want the people of Quraysh to find out that they were migrating to Abyssinia. Because had they known or had the people of Quraysh realized that the the Muslims were going to Abyssinia, they would have stopped them because they knew that these Muslims would actually start inviting people to Islam and people would start to join them and Islam would become stronger than they might come to Mecca. Stronger than that. Maybe one day they will come to Mecca as conquerors. The people of Quraysh, you know, they had a very good insight. So they they actually anticipated that the Muslims could do that. The Muslims traveled, as I said, in small groups, and then they met in Abyssinia. They were more than 80 people, men and women. Among them was uh, Uthman ibn Affan, who was married to the daughter of the Prophet ﷺ, Ruqayya. So Uthman and Ruqayya were among those who migrated to al Habasha, to Abyssinia. They went there when the people of Quraysh realized that the Muslims went to Abyssinia and now they're practicing their religion freely and they can practice it as much as they want. And then there's a possibility they might call other people to Islam. They said, we have to, you know, do something about that. So they sat, they thought about it. What can we do? They said, okay, the king of Abyssinia and Najashi is a very good friend of ours. So maybe... If we study this carefully and we plan it carefully, maybe we can convince him to give us to hand those people over to us. And then we will force them out of their religion. We will force them out of Islam. You know, if you notice, from the old days, there were always people conspiring against Islam and against the Muslims. You know, the Muslims who migrated to Abyssinia were some sort of asylum seekers. They only wanted to practice their religion. And because they couldn't live a life of dignity, they couldn't live in peace, and they were tortured and they were abused by their own people, they had no other option but to leave Mecca. Although it was, you know, it was the dearest place on earth to them. So they went to Abyssinia. They were trying only to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone, freely. They wanted to live with dignity. They wanted to have... This kind of freedom to worship Allah and enjoy the faith and exert themselves in more worship apart and away from that pressure, away from that abuse, away from that disgrace that they, they had to live with in Mecca. So they found the best time. One of, the, uh, one of these 
uh, immigrants actually is narrating the story. He said, you know, when we came to Al-Habasha, we found a just ruler. And in his land, we lived with dignity, with honor. We lived freely. We, we were safe. We felt the security. So we were thankful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for this wonderful gift. But when the people of Mecca realized that we were living in peace and we were enjoying our religion and the practicing of our religion, we were so happy, they decided not to give us that opportunity. So they schemed and they planned to send some of their men to the king of Al-Habasha, to Al-Najashi, to convince him to hand over the Muslims to the disbelievers so they can deal with them and force them out of the religion of Al-Islam. So the people of Mecca sat down together, they thought about it, and they sent two people. First of them was Amr ibn al-As and Abdullah ibn Rabi'ah, two men among the most intelligent people of Mecca, Amr ibn al-As and Abdullah ibn Rabi'ah. They were very intelligent because they, they, they actually, they were the public relations. They were the PR of the people of Mecca. They had so many relations with the kings of the Romans, the Persians of Abyssinia. Because they were very intelligent. They were the people of politics. They were dip, uh, proper diplomats. So they went. They sent with them so many gifts so they can bribe a Najashi and his, the people around him, his advisors, so that they can co convince al-Najashi to hand over the Muslims to Amr ibn al-As and Abdullah ibn Rabi'ah. They traveled. Now the thing that al-Najashi liked, so the gifts that al-Najashi liked to always to get from Mecca were, were the leather. Mecca was very well known for its trade and they could bring leather from all around the world. So actually they brought a lot of leather to al-Najashi as gifts. Amr ibn al-As and Abdullah ibn Rabi'ah came to al-Najashi and before they went to al-Najashi, actually they went to the patriarchs who were the advisors of al-Najashi because that was a Christian state. Al-Najashi was a Christian, he was an advocate of Christianity, actually he himself was a religious man and all his advisors were patriarchs. So Amr ibn al-As, Abdullah ibn Rabi'ah went to the patriarchs, they gave each one of them their gifts it was some sort of bribe, definitely. And they said, we came to your king with regards to some of our people. They left and they abandoned our religion, the religion of their forefathers, and they came with an innovated religion, a new religion. They came with some kind of heresy. And they insulted our gods and our religion, our, the religion of our forefathers. And, you know, our people who are, you know, their people, they want them back. Because they want to discipline them. So we are going to talk to your king and Najashi about them. So we would like you to advise him to hand them over to us. They said, okay, you get that from us. Now next day, they went to Najashi and Najashi was, you know, in his, on his throne sitting. And his patriarchs were around him. Amr ibn al-As and Abdullah ibn Rabi'ah, as diplomats from a different country, they came with all respect and all the procedures and all the compliments for, a, for some diplomats coming from a different land, they came to Al-Najashi. Then they said, they prostrated themselves before Al-Najashi. They said, O king, a bunch of people, they are from our city, they are from our people, they are our cousins, our brothers and our sisters. They came up with a new heresy, a new religion. They insulted our forefathers, they insulted our culture, and they, uh, you know, they, they spoke bad about our gods and our, about our way of life. And they dis disrespected us, they dishonored us. So our people, the chiefs of our tribe, of our city, sent us. They sent us to you, so that you hand over to us those people who left their religion, the religion of their forefathers, but they didn't even embrace Christianity. They came with a new heresy, a new religion no one knows about. So, and Najashi looked at his patriarchs, asking for their opinion. They said, well, we believe you should hand them over to their people and they take care of them. Because it seems that they created a lot of trouble back in Mecca. And Najashi became very angry. And he said, people, those are people who chose to live in my land. Who chose to live, who, who, found, that, who found out that I am just. They chose, my, they chose to live in my land over other countries. 
how can I just hand them over to you without even listening to them? So he said, no, I will call them and I will listen to what they have to say. And then, if they are as you claim, I will hand them over to you. If not, then I will protect them because they chose me. They chose to live in my land. There must be a reason why they chose to live with me, to live in my land. So he sent someone to bring the Muslims. When the Muslims heard about that, they were in confusion. They were taken by fear. They were paranoid. They said, what are we going to say to him? Now, they thought, they said, actually, we will say to him what we are upon. We will tell him about our religion. We will tell him about Muhammad wasallam. We will tell him about our reality. There's nothing to hide. And that's a very important lesson that we can take. We Muslims, you know, with, no matter what situation you are in, always tell the truth. Always speak about Islam. Don't try to hide things about Islam, you know. Always talk about Islam with all honesty. Even if people get you wrong, try to give them the right image, the correct image. And put your trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if you remember the hadith that we narrated last week, a very beautiful hadith, which the Prophet sallallahu narrates from Allah, directly from Allah, where Allah says, I will be to my servant as he thinks about me. If you think Allah will support you, then Allah will support you. But if you believe Allah will let you down, then Allah will let you down. This is a very beautiful, very powerful hadith that we have to learn and we have to benefit from. Allah will be to us as we think of Him. If we believe Allah will help us, then Allah will help us. If you believe Allah will protect you because you are on the truth, then Allah will protect you. But if you fear that Allah will let you down, then Allah will let you down. Why? Because you thought about because you don't have trust in Allah. You see how much freedom Allah has given us, how much power Allah has given us? Allah is just. Allah doesn't deal unjustly with people. So we have to understand this lesson. Now the Muslims who were in Abyssinia understood this fully. So they said, we will tell a Najashi about our religion. We have nothing to fear. We have nothing to hide. So they went to a Najashi. And Najashi addressed them and he said, what is that religion you came, you came up with? You left the religion of your forefathers, the religion of your people, you insulted their gods, and you didn't embrace Christianity or Judaism, you didn't join my religion or the religion of those people. What is that thing? What happened to you? Now that was a very, very, very difficult and critical moment for the Muslims. That was a question by the king. Amr ibn As was there, Abdullah ibn Rabi'ah was there. And they were determined to take the Muslims back, to torture, them and to, torture, to torture them and force them out of their religion. So Najashi addressed them in that serious way. What is the thing that you came up with? Explain to me. Now that was a very critical moment, very hard moment for them. How did the Muslims react to that? How did they reply? Inshallah, join us after the break to find out what happened. Stay tuned. It is just Allah's way to make our spirits strong. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Dear brothers and sisters, welcome to another episode of our series on supplication. The fact that it is part of Islam, it's a requirement, it's an obligation, it's a faridah, it's an act of worship that must only be devoted to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, no one other than Allah. He is close to you, He is qareeb, He is all hearing. So worship Him, make dua to Him, respond to Him and he will respond uh, to you. Brothers and sisters, to increase your iman. خيركم من تعلم القرآن وعلمه ورتل القرآن ترتيله Learning how to recite the Quran properly. Learning the meaning of what we recite. Concluding the ahkam from the verses which we recite. Trying to implement what we learn in our daily life. Would we'll listen to the participants and the guests. We'll take your phone calls. 
we're going to recite life. We'll listen to your recitation and we'll correct it according to the rules and regulations which will state in each episode. Now, your dream will come true. Will come true. <laughs> It is just Allah's way to make our spirits strong. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome back. You're still watching Inspirations. And we're still talking about a very important event that happened during the life of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That is the migration to Abyssinia. Um, I will remind you again that you can uh, write to us anything you, th uh, you think about the program, any suggestions, any comments, uh, you are welcome to write to us on our email address, inspirations at huda.tv. Inspirations at huda.tv. As I said, all your emails are welcome, and we're happy to uh, benefit th from them and uh, make good use of them, inshallah. So we said that uh, the people of Quraysh sent Amr ibn al-As and Abdullah ibn Rabi'ah to an najashi to try to get the Muslims back from there so they can really get hold of them and force them out of Islam and if, if not, at least, you know, torture them and put them under huge pressure. So uh, they went to an najashi and najashi called uh, some of the Muslims and the Muslims decided to say and to tell the truth about their religion. So he spoke to the Muslims seriously. He said, you left the religion of your forefathers, relig the religion of your people. It seems that you created a lot of trouble. You didn't join my religion or the religion of others. So what, what is that thing that you came up with? The one who spoke was Ja'far ibn Abi Talib, the cousin of the Prophet ﷺ. Ja'far stood and he said, O oh king, we were people who worshipped idols, who associated partners with Allah, who committed shirk. We were people who would eat the, dead, the bodies of dead animals, the caracas. We were people who would kill each other. We were people who didn't hold anything sacred, not any relationship, not anything, not even the blood of human beings. We didn't respect anybody. We didn't observe the rights of our, uh, of our kins. We didn't re observe the rights of our neighbors. We were, people living like, like, we were like people living in a jungle. We had no values whatsoever. We were people who would fornicate, people who would fall on, on all sorts of sins, and we were evil, evil people. And then... This messenger, he was one of us. He, he's one of us. He, we know his dignity, we know his honesty, we know his truthfulness, we know his uprightness, we know his character, and we know his, his conduct. He came to us with a message from, uh, from Allah, from our God, from the Creator. He called us to worship Allah alone. He, wor he called us to you know, hold the relations sacred, to... Uh, he called us to respect each other. He called us to give the rights of our relationships, to the, the, uh, the, you know, the rights of our relatives, of our kins, and to observe the rights of the neighbors, and not to fall in any vice or sin, and to help the poor, and to support others, and to respect our, our society. And he called us to everything that is noble, everything that is upright. So we believed in him. He called us to worship Allah alone. He called us to pray to Allah. He called us to fast and to give in charity. So we believed in him. So our people started torturing us. Our people started to abuse us. They started to kill some of us because they want to force us out of our religion. So an Najashi was taken by these beautiful words. This man is calling them to what is good. He's calling them to worship Allah alone. This is what... And Najashi was on, because he was in the true version of the message that Jesus, peace be upon him, was sent with. So, he saw that this man was calling them to worship Allah alone, to pray to Allah, to pay money in charity, to fast, and to respect the people, and to observe the rights of others. These are all noble things. So he asked Jafar, he said, did your Prophet come, come, come up with any revelation? Did he introduce to you any revelation? Can you relate to us some of the revelations he received? He said yes. So Ja'far ibn Abi Talib 
started reciting the beginning of Surah Maryam, the Surah of Mary. Now the Surah of Mary starts with the story of the Prophet Zakariya, Zakariya, when he supplicated to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant him a son. He was very old and his wife could not bear children. She was barren. She could not bear any children. And they were old enough. They, you know, they, were beyond, they actually exceeded the, the age of any possibility to have any children. But he supplicated to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give him a child. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him the glad tidings of having a child that, that will be a prophet. That was Yahya. Peace be upon him. So, Zakaria was amazed. How could I have a child at this age? And my wife, you know, couldn't bear children. And she's old enough anyway. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told him that Allah is capable of doing everything. So this is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then Allah, talked, Allah went on to talk about the story of Maryam, the mother of Jesus, the mother of Isa. Peace be upon him. That she left, she moved to the east of her town from her people. And then Allah sent to her Jibreel, who gave her the glad tidings of a son. But she wasn't married. She was amazed. He told her that this will be a sign from Allah and he will be a prophet. So he blew into her and then the child was in her womb. She gave birth to the, to the child. Then she came carrying the child. She came to her people. They said, Oh Mary, Oh Maryam, you are a righteous woman. What happened? How could you bear a child? How did you get this child? She pointed to him. He spoke. He spoke to his people. He said, I'm the servant of Allah and I'm a messenger for him. He gave me the knowledge of the book and the knowledge of the revelation. He's, Allah sent me to call you to the worship of Allah alone. So this was the Surah of Maryam, talking about these beautiful events. And Najashi was listening carefully to the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, these words that tell him about the Prophet Zakariya and Prophet Yahya and the Prophet, and the Prophet Isa ibn Maryam and the story of Mary herself. And Najashi was listening carefully. He was a man who followed, who followed the message that was sent to, to Jesus, peace be upon him. He was a man of faith, a man of God. He listened carefully and his patriarchs listened carefully. When Jaffa finished reciting the verses, he looked at the An-Najashi to see in, that An-Najashi was in tears. An-Najashi was taken by the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and so were his patriarchs. They realized that these were the words of Allah. These were the words of the Creator. These were the words of Allah who sent Moses, who sent Jesus, who sent Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa who sent Ibrahim, who sent all the prophets and all the messengers. They could realize that. And we know that the verses in Surah Al-Ma'idah that talk about, you know, the people who follow the real religion that was sent to Isa ibn Maryam, that when they hear the words of Allah, Allah says, subhanahu, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَإِذَا سَمِعُوا مَا أُنزِلَ إِلَى الرَّسُولِ تَرَى أَعْيُنَهُمْ تَفِيضُ مِنَ الدَّمْعِ تَرَى أَعْيُنَهُمْ تَفِيضُ مِنَ الدَّمْعِ مِمَّا عَرَفُوا مِنَ الْحَقِّ And when they hear the words that were sent down to the Messenger صلى الله عليه وسلم you find them in tears they can't help it. They start weeping because they recognize the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And such was the case of an Najashi and his patriarchs. They believed. An Najashi realized the, the, that those were the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Actually, the patriarch didn't believe in the message of Islam, but an Najashi did. An Najashi himself did. So he believed in the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala straight away. When he listened to these words, he said to Jafar, no, these words come from the same source as the words that came to Jesus, the words that came to Isa ibn Maryam. He said to him, go, 
live in my land and you will be safe. Anyone who tries to abuse you, anyone who tries to hurt you, then he will be punished. He will be punished. He will be punished. Then he turned to Amr ibn al-As and Abdullah ibn Rabia. He said to them, I will not hand those people over to you because they are on the truth. Go back to your land. They will live safe. They will live safely in my land. So go back. I'm not going to hand them over to you. And then everyone went back home. So the Muslims were very happy. Amr ibn al-As was very disappointed. He was very angry. Abdullah ibn Rabi'ah was very disappointed and very frustrated. How can we go back to Mecca? You know, without anything, without the Muslims. And, you know, actually the Muslims were triumphant and we lost. It seems that the Muslims are winning over even, you know, our people. Because the Najashi was a friend of ours. Now it seems that he, he's going to be a friend of the Muslims. So Amr ibn al-As being the, one of the most intelligent people of the Arabs, he, he thought of another plan. So he said, tomorrow I will go to a Najashi and I'm going to tell him something. When he hears that, he's going to destroy these Muslims forever. And we are going to get rid of them for good. So Abdullah ibn Rabi'ah said to him, what, 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 are you, you know, what are you planning to do? He said, I'm going to go to him and I will tell him that those people say that your God, the God that you worship, Jesus. But you know, because they thought that he was upon the same religion as the patriarchs who followed the distorted religion of Christianity. But a Najashi wasn't like that. A Najashi was looking for the truth. And he was following the true message of Jesus. Well, actually, what arrived to him, what he received from the message of Jesus or the remains of the message of Jesus. So I'm going to go to him tomorrow, and I will tell him that his God, that he worships Jesus, that they say that he's a slave, he's not a God. So Abdullah ibn Rabi'ah said to him, hold on man, you can't do that, calm down. These are our people, you will cause them to be killed. You will cause them to be executed. Don't do that, they are still our people, they are still our cousins, our brothers and our sisters. You can't do that. He said, no, I will go to him, and I will tell him that. So Amr ibn al-As next day went to An-Najashi and he said, you know the people that you are trying to protect? Do you know what they say about your God? He said, what do they say? He said, you, they say that your God, you, the God that you worship, Jesus, Isa ibn Maryam, they say that he's a slave and he's a, he's a human being. An-Najashi said, go and call them, go and invite them here. So someone from An-Najashi went to bring the Muslims. The Muslims heard and they knew, they realized what was going on. So they didn't know what to say. But Ja'far said, we will tell him what we believe about Jesus. We'll tell him what we believe about Isa ibn Marim, what our Prophet وسلم, told us about him, what Allah revealed to us in the Quran about him. We have nothing to hide and whatever happens, we put our trust in Allah. So they decided to go to an Najashi and tell him exactly what they believe about Al-Masih, about the Messiah, about Jesus, the son of Mary. Now what happened with them when they went to an Najashi? Join us after the break to find out inshallah about it. Everything's going wrong It is just Allah's way To make our spirits strong The deeds are bound by its intentions The deeds that we do We have to have a sincere intentions That we're doing it only for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala We have the best definitions of things The right vision, the criteria in which we would get to know what is right and what is wrong through the Qur'an and the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. The tafsir of the Qur'an is to explain, is to interpret the best words, the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala.
The religion of Islam is the fastest growing religion in the world, and the majority of that growth is taking place right here in the United States of America. According to most reliable estimates, there are more than 7 million Muslims living in the United States of America. Muslims have become valuable and vital assets to the American society. So please join me as I travel around America and introduce you to a few of the many Muslims in America. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome back. You're still watching Inspirations. Uh, before the break, we were talking about uh, the incident when Amr ibn al-As went back to Al-Najashi and see, he said to him that those people, those Muslims, actually what they do, they claim that your Lord, that your God you worship, that you worship, who was Isa ibn Maryam, Jesus, peace be upon him, that he's a slave, he's only a human being. So Al-Najashi called the Muslims. They didn't know what to say. Should we say the truth? Jafar, uh, oh, they agreed actually to say the truth and put their trust in Allah. There's nothing we have to hide. Islam is clear and we, say, we give it with its clarity. So they went to Al-Najashi and he said, he, said to them, he asked them, what do you say about Isa? What do you say about Jesus? So Jafar said, we say about him that he is a slave of Allah, the messenger of Allah, and the word of Allah and the spirit from his creation that he sent down to the Virgin Mary. He is Abdullahi wa Rasuluh, the slave and the messenger of Allah, wa kalimatuhu, his word, and wa ruhuhu, and the spirit from the spirits that he created, the spirit from him, he created it, that Allah sent down to the Virgin Mary, to the righteous woman, Maryam. Peace be upon them all. So an Najashi looked at him and he said, You know, Isa, Jesus, is nothing other than what you said. Isa is exactly how you described him now. So the patriarchs who were following the uh, distorted religion, the false religion of Christianity, that claims that Jesus was God or the Son of God, or any form, or, uh, some, or he has some, ki some kind of divine nature, okay? They started to mumble and make some noise as objecting to that. So Najashi said to them, even if you object to that, this is exactly what Jesus is. So that was Najashi. Really the Prophet ﷺ described him, he was a just man, he was a just ruler, and he's a fair person. He was a person who, who was looking for the truth. And this is why, as we will know inshallah in the future, that an Najashi died as a Muslim. He embraced Islam and he accepted Islam. So he was, he became a Muslim. He was a person who was looking for the truth. He was a real follower of Al-Masih, of Jesus, peace be upon him. He was a real follower of him. He was looking for the real message that came from Allah. So the patriarchs didn't like that. He said, even if you don't like it, even if you object to that, this is the reality of Jesus, peace be upon him. Al-Masih ibn Maryam, Jesus the son of Mary. So you could imagine how disappointed Amr ibn al-As was. He thought he was going to give it to them. But he was the one who lost. Then Najashi turned to him and he said, Take back all the gifts that you gave me. All the gifts you gave me. Okay, take them back with you. I don't want them. And these people will stay in my land safe. And I will protect them. And then he said to them, anyone who tries to attack you, anyone who tries to hurt you or harm you, I will punish him. I will punish him. Live safe in my land. Even if you give me the gold that is all around the world, you give it to me as a gift. I'm not going to hand over these people to you. I'm not going to hand them over. 
Allah protected my kingship. Allah protect, pr pr protected me from so many cons conspiracies. I'm not going to take a bribe and hand them over to you. So the Muslims lived safe in the land of Abyssinia, in the, under the reign of this just ruler, of this righteous man, and Najashi, may Allah have mercy on him. Then the Muslims said that we live very, we, li we live safely in his land, we were very comfortable worshipping Allah freely. Then one day, a king, someone came, okay, one of the leaders of an army, he tried to take over Abyssinia and he tried to get rid of Najashi. So we lived at that time in distress because we, 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 we feared that you know, it might, this, ki this king might take over and then he won't treat us justly as an Najashi did. So we were asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to support an Najashi and to grant him forgiveness and to grant him victory and triumph. So there was a huge and the big battle between an Najashi and that, uh, that person who was trying to take over. So the Muslims were very concerned what would happen. So they sent a Zubair. As Bay was a little boy, so he, he, he swam through the river, the Nile River, to the other bank where the battle was taking place, and he was observing everything. Then Allah gave victory to An-Najashi. So uh, Zubair came back to the Muslims and, and he was actually waving to them and he said, you know, I came to you with glad tidings. Allah gave victory and triumph to An-Najashi. So we can still live in Abyssinia here, practice our religion freely under the justice of this righteous man. So the Muslims lived freely there. Now there's a question that comes to mind. And Najashi said a beautiful statement. He said that Allah protected my kingship and I will not take bribe to hand over these people to you. I will protect them. What kind of bribe and what kind of protection that Najashi was referring to? Now this is a story that uh, the wife of the Prophet وسلم, Aisha, may Allah be pleased with her. Actually, she narrates to us a beautiful story about an Najashi. When an Najashi was a little child, his father was the king of Abyssinia. His father was the king and he had only one son, an Najashi. But he had one brother who was the uncle of an Najashi. This uncle of an Najashi, he had 12 children, 12 sons. So the people of Abyssinia, the advisors of the king, they conspired. They thought, they said, you know, even if the father of An-Najashi died, he only has one son, An-Najashi. And we don't know how long An-Najashi will live for. And we don't know if An-Najashi will have children. We can't guarantee that. But you know, his brother, who is the uncle of An-Najashi, has 12 children. So even if one of his children dies, or one of his children doesn't you know, have children, at least we have 12 of them, we will guarantee that you know, kingship will remain in their lineage, and we will have a king from that lineage, so we can you know, remain around him. But we don't know if a Najashi doesn't have children, and he takes over after his father, maybe one day he dies, then the whole of Abyssinia will be in chaos, as who will become the king? So let's sort out the problem, let's get rid of, let's assassinate the father of An-Najashi, the king, and give kingship to his brother, who is the uncle of An-Najashi. And then we can guarantee that his 12 children will remain there. And we can guarantee, because it seems that there, you know, that family was seen or was held in, in some kind of uh, sacredness. They were given some kind of sanctity and sacredness among the people of Abyssinia. So they wanted kingship to remain among this family, in the uh, descendants of this family. They conspired, they planned, and they did kill the father of An-Najashi, and they appointed his brother as the king. Now An-Najashi was very intelligent. He grew up to be a very intelligent, very learned person. So he became the assistant number one to his uncle, the king. So his uncle couldn't do anything without the advice of An-Najashi, without the help of An-Najashi. Because An-Najashi was very influential and was very intelligent person. Now, when those people who killed the father of An-Najashi saw that An-Najashi is, is becoming very, very close to the king, and it seems that when the king, if the king is about to die, he would, you know, give kingship after him. He would give the crown to An-Najashi. 
So they said, if Najashi takes over after his uncle, he knows that we killed his father. So he would definitely get rid of us and execute us, all of us. So let's get rid of Najashi himself. Let's either kill him or expel him out of Abyssinia. So they went to the king, the uncle of Najashi. They said to him, we see that this guy, Najashi, your nephew, is getting very close to you and he's occupying a very important position. We are afraid that you would you know, give him the crown and you will make him the king after you. And if, he, if you do so, then he would kill us because he knows that we killed his father. We assassinated his father. He knows that we conspired to kill his father. He said, well, you killed his father and now you want to kill him? He said, okay, I will take the lesser harm. Okay, you can expel him out of Abyssinia, no problem. But don't kill him. So they took him and they took him to the market, to the slave market where they used to sell and buy slaves. So they sold him as a slave. Someone took him on a ship and traveled. On that same day, you see the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. On that same day, it was raining. So the king, the uncle of Najashi, was standing outside his palace. And he was struck by, uh, by a lightning came. It was a, a storm and the lightning hit him. There was thunder and lightning and he was hit by lightning, by thunder, and he died straight away. So those advisors looked around, they said, wow, the king is dead. So let's go and see which of his ch children is more qualified, is more you know, eligible to, uh, to be the king, to take over. So when they checked all his children, none of them is capable or is even able all of them were naive, all of them they had some mental problems. So they didn't know what to do. They were in real trouble. So they thought, they thought, they said, you know, the only one who can really be the king of this land is the one that you sold this afternoon. So go and get him back. So they sent in all direction, people in all direction, trying to find where Najashi was. And finally they got him. So they brought him back and they gave him the throne. They said, you are the king. So the man who bought an Najashi, he came and he said, you have to give me back my money. You took my slave away from me. Give me my money back. They said, no. He said, okay, I will go to him and I will ask him to give him my money. Because he realized that he, he was the king. He was actually the son of the first king. So he went to him. He said, you know, king, uh, I bought a slave today and... Those people, your advisors, took him from me today and they didn't give me back my money. So an Najashi said, you either give him back his money or he takes his slave. He was a very intelligent person. He knew how to deal with these people. So they said, okay, okay, we'll give him back his money. Then an Najashi became the king and he ruled over Abyssinia. You see how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protected his kingship and he gave it back to him. Those people conspired but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protected him. Allah was planning something for this man, for this righteous man. So this was the story of Abyssinia. This was the story of the Muslims who migrated to Abyssinia. Now, let's travel away from Abyssinia back to Mecca. What was happening there? Now, there were some interesting stories happening. To find out, I invite you to join us next week, inshallah, to talk about that. So until we meet then, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Allah knows what's best for us, so why should we complain? We always want the sunshine, but He knows there must be rain. We always want the laughter and the merriment of cheer. But our hearts will lose their tenderness If we never shed a tear So whenever we feel that Everything's going wrong It is just Allah's way To make our spirits strong and the merriment of cheer But our 
our hearts will lose their tenderness if we never shed a tear. So whenever we feel that everything's going wrong, it is just Allah's way to make our spirit.